Thank you to Sarah for a beautiful reading of Paul's letter to the church at Corinth, a church which, some 30 years after the resurrection of Jesus, was now starting to understand and wrestle with, uh, in Paul's letters we read all about it, wrestle with how they within the church are understanding themselves and how that's perceived as a witness to Christ beyond themselves. And that's something that we want to look at. In our gospel reading, this is the beginning of the journey, the very beginning of the journey for Jesus' disciples as they're being called to follow by this amazing new rabbi. So listen to this reading from the fourth chapter of Matthew. Now, when Jesus heard that John the Baptist had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets. And Jesus called them. Immediately, they left the boat and their father, and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. May God bless this reading to us, for friends, this is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A wonderful reading, and we can remember from several trips to Israel, walking along the sea at Capernaum and envisioning these passages of Jesus there with his disciples. It was a wonderful experience for us both. Before we lived live here now in Wisconsin, we lived only about an hour and a half by train from New York City the center of majestic theater and inspiring, sophisticated music. And so, for my birthday celebration one year, Honoré took me to see a Broadway show, which was wonderfully, wonderfully unique. And what was that show? It was Monty Python's Spamalot. <laughs> Will any of you admit that you've seen Spamalot? No, you won't. Oh, but some brave soul admits that they've seen spam a lot. Well, I happen to be a fan of British humor, which is not an oxymoron. The Brits can be quite humorous, although that's spelled H-U-M-O-U-R-O-U-S, humorous. But one of the highlights of the show for me was their their own unique version of the classic Broadway love song entitled... The song that goes like this. Once in every show, there comes a song like this. It starts out soft and low and ends up with a kiss. Oh, where, oh, where is the song that goes like this? Where is it? Where, where? where? A sentimental song that casts a magic spell. They all will hum along, will overact like, hmm. Well, we are in church. 
For this is a song that goes like this. And of course, it does go on and on like this, and the lyrics even say it's going to go on and on and on. And it modulates into a different key twice, and it gets too high for them to actually sing it right, and it's louder and louder, and well, you get the picture. I'm sure you'll experience it next week. I imagine the choir will sing the full unredacted version of it. <laughs> yeah, Kathy, Kathy's nodding. I can't wait. Friends, it is not often that Monty Python gets quoted in a sermon. But the point that's made by the song that goes like this, it really is a good object lesson for the church today. That the, the typical, in the usual place, at the expected time, with the standard format, can become viewed like a fact of life. That's the way it is. Whether it's the plot of a Broadway musical or it's the routines of relationship and job and family and community life, or the ongoing cycles of a congregation for both the people within and also outside. We make assumptions about what was and what now is and then therefore what always will be. And in doing so, sometimes the spontaneous and the, the surprising and the life-changing and even the miraculous possibilities get turned into something that well, it's, it's out there, but it's not right here. It's not right now. It's, it's, it's somewhere, sometime. But for us in the here and now, it seems like we are not going to make a difference. When the expected becomes the norm, when the usual becomes the expected, do you make a difference? That was something Jesus confronted with his disciples time and time and time again. One of, one of my mentors in ministry was a man named Ed White. And Ed was a, an author, many books for the Almond Institute, and also a church consultant. And this is the way that, that Ed summarized the quest of a Christian to discover purpose in the heart and will of God. It's in a book which is entitled, appropriately for today, This Calls for You. The spiritual journey is not an otherworldly enterprise. It has to do with life over death, much more than life after death. The discovery of God is within each of us. Enlightenment, like an ocean voyage, will not always be smooth sailing. But our sense of self in Christ, our purpose in this life, our Christian vocation, will keep us steadily on course. Just as a compass guides sailors to their true destination, so too will God's call guide us into the safe harbor of eternal life and eternal love. I was really pleased to meet Ed several times in programs for, for study and learning, and I learned so much from him about the importance of the way that we view ourselves as Christians, the, the lenses, if you will, through which we look at ourselves as Christians who are called by Jesus Christ as those disciples to be fishermen and fisherwomen, and then how that projects a witness out to others beyond us. And so it, I think it's a very important question for us to face, particularly during this, this interim period between one long-term installed pastorate and the next. And it's not just how the church, this church, looks to us, but rather... It's how do we, this congregation, this church, this group of Christians, how do we represent Christ? 
How do we witness to Christ? How do we look to those who look at us to understand something about God? Another way of putting it is, if we weren't here, would it make a difference? I earlier in our time here introduced you to someone who's been such an inspiration, our former moderator of our Presbyterian General Assembly, Marge Carpenter, a a journalist, a bombastic Texan, and a number one advocate for mission and ministry. Once while Marge was visiting Guatemala, a place where Presbyterians had concentrated mission and ministry, while the Methodist Church and the Moravians and the Lutherans and other denominations have focused energies in neighboring countries. But she was in Guatemala, and she was there with a mission worker I know, David Young, and they went into a small village. And when they went into the small village, all of the people in the village frantically ran away. And Marge reflects on that. She she shares, I said to David, what's wrong here? Oh, All the doors and the gates were slamming, and there was an instant ghost town with only one small boy left walking in the square. David told me that the farm workers there had gotten into trouble a few weeks before, and the military had come to arrest them. And when the villagers resisted, fearing that none of them would ever come back or be seen again, David told her the military killed all the people in the square, and the incident was never reported, which is a pattern. And Marge writes, as we stood there, one elderly woman came up along the fence, close enough so that she could call out to us, but far enough away so that she could run. And she called out one word, Presbyteriano? And I said, yes, we're Presbyterians. And she said, come. And she took us to the church. And I asked her, how did you know we were Presbyterian? And her answer is important to all of us. Her answer may be scary for all of us. She answered saying, because because the Presbyterians are the only ones who still come up here to help us. And Marge concluded, what if we didn't go? What if we quit going? Those questions are very, very important for us as all Christians, for all churches, not just Presbyterians. Those are questions for all of us, whether in denominational churches or independent churches, even if our life experience or the experience of those that we know and see and love is, isn't vaguely like that of villagers in conflict-torn Guatemala. And it's an important answer to those questions because it defines the difference between cheap grace and grace from God which transforms the world. Let's reflect for a moment on that passage from Matthew of the call of disciples. The early Christians who first heard this gospel from Matthew, the gospel was written down about 50 years after the resurrection of Jesus and birth of the church. Those who heard the gospel of Matthew for the first time, they were like the disciples of Jesus in many, many ways. They were probably humble Workaday folk, they too were probably puzzled at some of the teachings he gave and the hard sayings. But in one way, they were very, very different from those first disciples because they knew the end of the story. They knew the cost that Jesus was going to pay for those teachings and his ministry. They knew the cross of Jesus. They knew of the martyrdom of almost all of those disciples who followed Jesus. And after 50 years of believing in Jesus, following Jesus, living and dying for faith in Jesus, 
That early church, hearing Matthew's gospel, also knew, unlike the disciples who left their nets to follow this astonishing new rabbi, they knew that become fishers of people was a calling which could very well demand their goods, their security, their own lives, even their loved ones all because they had come to understand the truth of life over death in Jesus. For all the years that I've been an ordained minister, serving as both a pastor and also serving the broader church, I've heard congregations all asking similar questions. They may be familiar for us. How do we get more members? How do we invite and involve and speak to younger generations? How do we meet budgets with limited resources? How do we survive in these changing times? And to be honest with you, most of the time congregations will continue then after asking those questions, they'll continue to sing the song that goes like this. Doing what it is that we do and have always done, trying to do it better, with more organization, maybe more energy, perhaps new leadership. It's what most people, even non-church people, expect of the church, of a congregation. And since it seems to demand so little, it becomes even easier to take our sense of direct calling from God for granted. But congregations that seem to be truly thriving and growing and excited and exciting seem to be asking different questions. And they're asking these questions about everything they do, from their small groups to the meetings of their commissions and their committees to the ways they share their faith naturally with others to the visits that they make to those who can't regularly come to the church on Sunday for for whatever reason. And the questions they're asking are like this. How will God use me? How will God use us? in surprising ways today. What will I hear in the sermon today that will touch and change the trajectory of my life? Whom will I meet today that needs a a kind word or maybe an invitation to a church program or ministry or a group? What new idea can I share that will make a difference for someone? What is my unique calling? What is the special way that God can use my life, however grand or however humble? And most centrally, what does it mean when Jesus says to me, to us, follow me? There's an ancient story about a saint, a saint whose wonderful deeds astonished even the angels. The angels came down to earth to learn the secret of his piety, and wherever that this saint went, he diffused virtue as a flower gives off fragrance without even being aware of it. The angels returned to heaven, and they asked that this saint might be given the gift of miracles, and God consented. So back to earth came the angels. And there they asked this man if he would like by the touch of his hand to heal the sick. And he replied, no, I would rather that God should do that. Then would would you like to convert guilty souls and bring them back to right paths? And he said, no, it is the Spirit's mission to convert. I only pray. The angels were persistent. Would you like to be a model of patience and draw others with your piety? 
And the saint responded, No, if others were attracted to me, they might become distanced from God. Well, the exasperated angel said, well, then, then what do you desire? And back came this reply, that God would give me God's grace, that I might do a great deal of good without knowing it. Well, the angels were perplexed. And finally, they resolved that whenever the shadow of the saint would fall where he couldn't see it, his very shadow would cure disease and comfort sorrows. See, when we start making the startling realization that God truly wants to make a difference through us, each one of us, then we become used to asking every day and all the time, what does it mean to follow Christ? And before long, we won't even have to ask that question, but just do and expect and hope and dream and live out God's love. Because the sunlight from God is so bright and brilliant, it never fades. And so let's make it our goal and our purpose, our calling to follow, to cast the shadow of Jesus Christ's love over any and all we meet. Whether it's a church program or the places where we work or the strangers that we meet. If we are people of Christ, Christ does not ask if we make a difference. Christ shows us how we make a difference. Let's be in prayer. Holy God, call us by the voice of your Christ once more. Help us to leave our nets of worry and preoccupations long enough to truly cast forth the love upon a hurting world, to replace aimlessness with your holy purposes, and to witness to your care for all people in the name and presence of Jesus Christ. Amen.